We are now going to switch over to the investor pitch competition. I'd like to now bring back our speaker from earlier today, Ms. Julie Lerner, who is the founder and CEO of Pan Exchange. Julie is going to be your moderator, and I'll be back with you after the winners are announced to lead you into the networking portion of the evening. All right, Julie, over to you. Well, uh, that was fast. I thought you would be around for a while and help me out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, no, I'm happy to do this. I'm really excited about it. Um, looks like we've got a huge uh, audience um, and a lot of ground to cover. So we have about 18 minutes just to just to get uh, get everything set up, introduce all the investors, talk a little bit about the structure. Um, I am I am Julie Lerner, by the way, founder and CEO of Pan Exchange. Um, I'll be introducing the judges in just a second, but I'm hoping to talk to you all about structure here. So each CEO is going to have five minutes with four minutes q and I'm going to do my best to keep you to that, which means I'm probably going to interrupt you. Um, it is your risk whether you want to keep moving forward or allow time for a judge to ask another question. Um, during the Q&A, companies uh, can have another team member join them when answering the questions. Um, then the judges and audience will rank the presentations. So speaking of ranking, we have an incredibly diverse group of nine different companies, um, which, is, which is amazing. And I can't wait to hear about every one of them. And by the way, I've been on both sides of this. I've done many pitch competitions myself. Um, to the judges, I've offered up a guideline just so everyone can, can be consistent apples to apples with each company. So on a scale of one to five, with one being the lowest, five the highest, um, business model, is it clear? Technology, have you demonstrated the execution in terms of tech and, and as a business driver, if that's relevant? Innovation, how innovative is it? And, and how much proof of concept do you have? and product execution. Um, so, and then judges, I think you've all seen the link that Brad gave you to take that summary and put it into, uh, into the, t the one, one score, one to five for all the, for all the contestants. Um, I'd be remiss here if I didn't mention something, um, as I'd mentioned, greatly diverse group of pitch um, companies. Um, I want to, I know that you don't, you're obviously not going to do it right now. I need to talk to you about a TED talk I've seen by a woman named Dana Conze. She, please humor me for a minute. She took 2000 tech crunch pitches and Q and A sessions. And here's what she found. The investors, men and women found that they asked men questions, uh, the male entrepreneurs questions that was all about upside and the future and kittens and rainbows. Like, what's your addressable market? And then they would ask female investors um, questions that put them on the defensive. Like, how do you expect to, to protect your, your, your market share? And it puts them on their heels. And I don't remember the number, but it resulted in about 78% less funding for the, for the women founders. So personal request to you all, if you could, Take a second before you ask your questions. Try to keep it consistent for all of our entrepreneurs. They work really hard um, and just, just want to be fair and, and have some fun here. So let's go to the judges. So I'll introduce each one of you. And if I've overlooked something on the, um, on the bio, please feel free to jump in and also um, for those of you with investment portfolios, we'd love to hear the, in, uh, the elevator pitch on what you guys look for, and then I'll ask some more directed questions to others. So first up is David Hess. He's the president and co-founder of Trust Capital. A two-time cancer survivor, David was introduced to the vast benefits of medical cannabis while undergoing cancer treatments. And he's since dedicated himself to further research, awareness, and business opportunities in the expanding cannabis industry. Trust is a strategic private investment firm embedded at the core of global cannabis sector, originating and managing, in, managing investments for high net worth individuals, family offices, and institutional investors. Trust has a track record of successful industry investment and works closely with, with its companies 
and the industry providing active value-added support. Uh, David, welcome. Thank you, Julie. How are you? I'm well. I don't see you on. There you are. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting used to this format. So I hope I, um, I covered that well for you. Do you have an elevator pitch for what you look for in companies to invest sure. in? Sure. Typically, um, we've looked at companies uh, that we've defined as uh, the legs of this industry. Uh, so typically infrastructure. And uh, we, we've generally had a strong eye on ESG companies, uh, companies that have an impact uh, greater on greater than their bottom line, um, you know, more on the uh, global impact as well. Thank you. Okay. Next up, David Kunick. Apologies if I didn't pronounce that right. He's the CEO of USC Advisors. David's an entrepreneur who specializes in investor relations advisory services. Um, he's raised capital, expanded several companies, employed over 300 people. He's been in the medical field for 18, over 18 years, been a business owner for over 19 years, and in the cannabis industry for over 10 years. Uh, David has assisted many companies securing millions of dollars for his clients, ranging from cannabis, hemp, energy, medical, water, and beverages. He served on numerous boards and an advisor and trusted source of information. Welcome, David. Uh, th thank you for having me, Julie. Appreciate that. Um, so yes, uh, Dr. David Kunick, actually I'm, I've been in the medical field for over uh, 18 plus years. Um, I apologize for the background to everyone. I'm actually located up in Maine right now, actually checking on one of our hemp clients who's growing over 2,000 acres across the country. Um, pretty much what we look for is really what we tell everyone. Rule number one, failure to plan is planning to fail. We want to make sure that you have your plan in place. We want to make sure that if you're taking investment money, do you have an exit strategy for your investors? And we work with both the companies to get them prepared to take on investors. And we work with both a lot of high net worth individuals, both domestically and internationally, that are looking for good, unique deals. And I'm really looking forward to being here today and, and hearing today's pitches. So thank you for having me today. Fantastic. Thank you. Next up, Jay Kaway. Jay is the co-founder and managing partner of Supercritical LLC. Jay comes to us with over 30 years of financial market experience at the CBOE and, and the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Um, so I'm ad living here, Jay, because I know you. Um, accomplishments ex include expanding operations and developing and launching products, um, specifically exchange traded products such as Bitcoin futures, corporate bond index futures, SBX um, options, and so forth. And he's bringing all of that expertise into the cannabis industry for super critical. Um, the firm advances investors' participation in the cannabis, hemp, and ancillary marketplaces and provides consulting services to address clients' critical issues and exact, ex extract maximum value for your business as they navigate rapidly changing marketplace. Did I miss anything, Jay? No, that was excellent. It's good to see you again, Julie. Good you to too. see everyone. And thanks, uh, thanks to all for coming together for such an important topic and discussion. Excellent. Um, thanks, Jay. So then we have John uh, Nemanik. I'm so sorry. <laughs> He's a, he, will, he will tell you how to pronounce it in just a second. Green Coast, he's a partner at Green Coast Capital International. Um, it's, it's international investor providing flexible and innovative financing to small cap and micro cap marketplaces. The, the team is experts in capital markets, um, capital market making quick decisions and providing growth capital to issuers. John's a serial entrepreneur and investor He's co-founder, chairman, and CEO. He's exited three very successful internet startups. Um, and there's a lot more interesting things here on your bio, but I'll let you jump in right now. <laughs> I was really enjoyed reading this. So. Well, thank you. Been around for a while. Uh, surname is Nemanic. Um, what do I look for? People, structure, story. Who are the people? What's their track work? What have they done? Structure, how's the business organized? How are they gonna scale? Story. What do they have to offer? What differentiates in the marketplace? Okay, thank you. 
Next up, we have Michael Boniello. Again, I hope I got that right. Managing Director, Poseidon Investment Management. Michael is responsible for early stage diligence on companies, managing the policy and regulatory landscape for the firm, as well as co-managing investor relations for Poseidon's funds. He spent the past year raising capital for Poseidon's second fund, which is now closed. Congratulations on that. Prior to Poseidon, Michael spent several, seven years between Merrill Lynch Private Banking and Investment Group at Barclays. Welcome, Michael. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me today. It's been a, uh, a great conference thus far. Um, real quick, to give you a little background, Poseidon manages the two funds. Um, as you mentioned, we, we uh, currently, or just recently closed our second fund to new investors and are allocating capital in that fund. And ultimately what we're looking at, uh, we look at uh, about half plant touching, half non-plant touching infrastructure plays, as David Hess had mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, we look at this as a multi-billion dollar retail and agricultural, in excuse me, industry with uh, very little and very fragmented infrastructure. And we think there's a lot of opportunities there. And ultimately we're looking for good operators, um, hopefully that have a track record in Canvas. I know that's not easy to find, but really people that have a blueprint to execute a real plan. And that's something that we don't see a lot of times where we see pro formas that start to get a little crazy after the first or second year. And I think uh, living up to those expectations are very difficult and we like operators who uh, uh, are taking a little bit more prudent approach. It is interesting how some of the structure has in this gold rush of hemp has been thrown out the window. So I appreciate the discipline on that. Um, next up, we have Matthew Nordgren, founder and CEO of Arcadian Funds. Matthew is an ambitious executive, dedicated philanthropist, and accomplished athlete who brings unique passion to creating strategic alliances. He brings a, a breadth uh, and depth of experience in finance, corporate development, capital sourcing, as well as building highly motivated teams of skilled professionals. He's currently the CEO and founder of Arcadian Fund and Arcadian Capital Management, a venture fund that, that invests in ancillary businesses in and around cannabis and hemp industries. Um, more specifically, Series A type um, opportunities where proven businesses are looking for growth equity. I think I'm going to leave it there and let you jump in and speak for yourself, Matthew. Hey, thanks, Julie. Glad to be here uh, with so many great industry leaders and friends. Um, I think the things you've heard so far are similar to the things we look for in terms of what John and Michael and David and everybody has already said. Um, one of the more uh, important things that I get, think haven't been mentioned is timing. You know, we all are trying to figure out timing. It seems like every year it's like, well, next year. Um, but next year might be the year. And so ultimately we'll look back. I don't think history has been written at all in this industry. So it, it just a world of opportunity ahead. And we're looking for businesses that understand how to be prudent, how to understand how to, you know, really be a great team, uh, but also not get ahead of themselves and not be too far behind themselves. So timing is really important. I think the last thing that we'd like to say, probably uh, out of our couple of funds, I think we're around 35 companies now. So the ecosystem is important to us as well. A lot of times a great opportunity comes across that meets a lot of our mandates, but quite frankly, we can't see how we can add the value we like to add as investors. And I think my friends on this call will agree. Uh, we're constantly trying to provide value to companies. It's not just about writing a check. Um, so more than ever, now is our opportunity to do that because we get to have structures that make sense. Before, we couldn't compete with Canadian public company banker structures. They, would, they, would, they didn't like corporate governance and independent boards and these types of things. So um, now you get to do that. It's really a good feeling. We're excited for these companies from a timing standpoint. And I think it's really important that investors try to have, add a lot of value. It's not just money anymore. You really need to be with these companies. Uh, on this last stretch here, however long it takes. Excellent, thank you. Next up, we have Nick Easley, CEO and Managing Director of Multiverse Capital, also spoke earlier today. Nick is the CEO and Managing Director for Multiverse, a globally recognized cannabis industry expert. He's also the founder and CEO of 3C Consulting, LLC, the nation's leading strategic cannabis consulting firm. Nick and his team have worked in 16 countries, 34 states, and two territories, assisting nearly 500 cannabis companies across all sectors of the industry. He 
He received the High Times Trailblazer Blazer Award in 2015 and was named one of the rising stars in cannabis investment by Business Insider. And Nick is a veteran of the US Air Force. Welcome, Nick. Thanks, pleasure to be back with everybody here this afternoon. Um, beard is longer than the last time. Um, <laughs> Really good to see all of you. I know we've, we've gotten to have a lot of fun with these kind of pitch competitions and really it's fun, but it, it's real. This is where the rubber meets the road in this industry. I, I mean, I started in Colorado back in 2006 after I got out of the military just as a medical patient and seeing what wasn't a regulated industry or business form out of chaos in an illicit market and caregivers doing their best to provide quality medicine to patients that deserved it and was legal in their states. Now seeing what's happening on a national basis, like with hemp companies, cannabis companies, the ancillary businesses that support them, it's incredible. But we can't just go public anymore. It's not 2015, 16, 17. I'm not a billion dollar unicorn because I have an idea to do something. So when we're, my investment community and I are vetting investment opportunities, really the first thing I look at, is it compliant? You know, if it's a cannabis company, that's really important. From a hemp standpoint, all of their licenses and production abilities, if it's not compliant, I'm not interested because it's a risk and a liability. Any investment, why put additional risk and in investment um, if it's not going to be compliant and be able to scale? And there are thousands and thousands of companies now. What makes that mm -hmm. company unique? Some people look at like, let me stack my team with these advisory board members and pay me each 5K to like look good on my pitch deck. That's not what I care about. Who are the people that are going to be touching and using the capital that we are entrusted by our limited partners and our own capital to actually manage that capital and get returns for our investments? I mean, we were one of the largest ESG kind of investment focused impact investing funds that I know of, but this whole industry is like that. So I really embrace that. But at the end of the day, if it doesn't make sense, it doesn't make dollars and you can't touch it just because it might be a unique market or a unique opportunity. If it's not compliant, if it doesn't meet our thesis, we're not interested. And specifically when a company knows I need $2.7 million to do this, and this is how I'm going to use that. And here's how much my company is worth and what I'm giving to you. I need to know that. Don't come to us like we need two to six million dollars. You don't know know your business. So companies that have to understand who they are, what they do, why they do it. That's us. Thank you. So one more uh, judge I'd like to introduce you to is Seth Freeman. He's the senior managing director of Glass Ratner Advisory and Capital Group. Uh, Seth is co-leader of the Cannabis and Hemp Business Advisory and Restructuring Practice there. His team is one of the most experienced CBD and hemp restructuring groups in the US. He is a bankruptcy, insolvency, and restructuring consultant, crisis turnaround manager, and asset manager with over 30 years of consulting experience. He's an expert in chapter 11 restructuring and alternative restructuring procedures available to cannabis companies. Welcome, Seth. Where are you, Seth? Seth here? I don't think Seth is here, which actually leaves me on time. That was the most stressful piece that I had to do. I wasn't sure I was gonna get through all those intros and keep us on time. All right, we're gonna jump right into it, team. Um, our first entrepreneur, I wish you all good luck on this. Have some fun with it. Um, Elaine, and, and I have already butchered names and I'm gonna butcher more and I'm so terribly sorry. I didn't get to go through this before. Elaine Richer is the CEO and founder of My Cure All. She's a highly seasoned pharmacist and healthcare professional um, with, has held leadership roles in three Fortune 500 companies, including Rite Aid, Walgreens, and CVS. She's been a licensed pharmacist for over 20 years. Um, what, what's exciting about her bio is her goal is to decrease opioid overdose, overdoses, decrease deaths from suicides and overdoses, reunite families suffering from drug addiction and help patients achieve the most effective pain control. My Cure All started in 2019. It's pre-revenue, six employees, $300,000. Welcome, Elaine. Hi, thank you so much, Julie, for this warm introduction. And I uh, wanna give a shout out to Brad uh, for putting this together. This has been a really a remarkable uh, webinar. So thank you very much, great job. So as Julie mentioned, my name is Elaine Richer and I am the CEO of Mike Ural. I am joined today by my partner and COO, Jacques Nier. Uh, Mike Ural is a healthcare technology company. Our mission is to bring physical, social, and financial relief from the opioid epidemic and accelerate the acceptance of the legal cannabis industry into the mainstream healthcare and insurance system. 
As experts in the pharmaceutical, social work, and medical cannabis fields, our goal is to properly, consistently, and effectively manage medical cannabis administration by allowing patients, doctors, dispensaries, and insurers to work hand in hand for safer and more effective healthcare. Medical cannabis is being established in the scientific community as the medication of choice, but the current methods of prescribing cannabis is widely inaccurate. Patients spend time and money using trial and error methods to discover what cannabis strains work best to manage their symptoms. Medical professionals do not know the correct strain and dosage recommended based on patients' qualifying conditions. Medication-assisted treatment, supplementary med medication uh, treatment, and harm reduction specialists are unable to recommend optimal dosing and strains. One of the primary reasons we got involved, and only one of many conditions, the opiate epidemic, which during COVID-19 has spiked greatly um, on overdoses and hospitalizations. 400,000 people died from opiate overdoses from 1999 to 2017. Annual deaths from opiate overdoses are projected to reach nearly 82,000 by 2025. According to the National Institute of Health, NIH, substance abuse costs the country over $600 billion per year. So we quickly realized that we should focus on the platform for all medical cannabis and CBD. The MyCureOl app enables patients, physicians, dispensers, and insurance companies to work hand in hand to achieve a natural solution to a plethora of medical conditions. Through our patent pending technology, Scanimeter and Canimeasure, doctors are able to identify and recommend specific strains and CBD products and cannabinoids for qualifying conditions and presenting symptoms. Dispensers are able to manage inventory of various cannabis strains while providing effective care based on cannabis needs, on patients' needs, which is something that we're currently testing in several dispensaries. Insurance companies will save money by reimbursing for medical cannabis versus paying for opioids and associated costs via treatment plans that are empowered to reduce symptoms and increase functioning in society. Patients will be receiving the correct strain and strengths for their medical conditions, allowing for safer and more effective treatment and allowing patients to actually actively participate in their own wellness through targeted and consistent treatment plans. Our app will regularly check in with patients to track, analyze, and guide treatment. When you talk about patent pending technology, let's show a quick video of how it operates. Elaine, I think you need to share your screen. Uh, it's not showing? No. We're running into the same webinar issue. Okay. So with the can the can meter, which is actually the client enters into the uh, program, there's a baseline for that in which a, a client ingests their medicinal cannabis. It is registered based on three qual or three um, conditions related towards the qualifying condition. That baseline also takes into their cannabinoid profile. So CBD and THC are being registered right now. In the, in the future, in the back end, we have all the terpenes and cannabinoid properties there. After they ingest their, their medicinal cannabis, we take in other um, examination of how those particular symptoms were affected by that cannabis. And we make a measure. Anything greater than 50 is registered as a positive effect for that client and is re recorded. It also has an objective version of that. Now, going to the cannometer, which is more the recommender, both the dispensaries and the doctors are able to use the profile that a client feels a positive result with THC, CBD, or strain, and is allowed to find other recommendations based on that particular qualifying condition. Right? Okay, so U.S. legal One minute, can One minute Oh, wow. U.S. legal cannabis sales are set to more than quintuple to $41 billion by 2025. The global CBD market was valued at $3 billion in 2018 and is expected to reach $22 billion by 2026. So our company received state clearance from Department of Health and Department of Insurance to operate in four states currently, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Florida. In just four states, we're looking at the market size of 23 million people. Currently, 33 states, Washington, D.C., and several territories offer medical cannabis as a legal treatment option. 
Our revenue is based on subscription model and targeted medical marketing. Our calculations for the five-year projections provided that only 33 states remain medical cannabis legal and that we capture only 10% of the market. Uh, however, based on the political and medical and economic projections, cannabis will be medically legal in every state in the nation, nation uh, within the next few years. So projected revenue from our CBD arm of the business is expected to reach EBITDA close to $12 million by 2022. We do have competition in place, uh, Leafly, Relief, Strain Print. Uh, you can take a look as far as the expense and the features that we are offering. Uh, so our uh, competitive advantage lays in the standardized set of protocols, in the streamlining of the recommendation process, in the creation of the insurance claim, and the self and recommender assessments tools, which will help both physician and the patient assess their situation. Use of funds, uh, we are currently trying to raise $2 million for capital raise. 750 will be going to marketing and sales, 500 to software development, and 750,000 will be going towards operations. Our exit strategy in incorporates acquisition, financial buyers, investors, and IPO. You can see a list of those features right there. As we're running out of time, I wanna make sure we get through this. Um, and I do want to give a shout out and recommend our, our management team, which we are proud to have a diverse and multidisciplinary team that is well, well versed in the cannabis industry and great entrepreneurship. Okay, thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to jump in right now. We've got time for one quick question. Do any of our judges want to jump in on here? I'm happy to jump in. Okay. Um, question on the, the use of proceeds or sales and marketing. I was just wondering if you could give it a little bit more detail. Um, when I look at your, your deck and your solution page with patients, physicians, insurance companies, dispensaries, who would, who would you be marketing first? You know, how ultimately do you, do you get this to catch on along all of these different types of uh, companies and patients? So as far as advertising and marketing, we want to trigger with the doctors and we want to uh, trigger with the prescribers. We want to make sure the clients know the services out there, as well as the insurance companies. We want to make sure that we're also hitting, that we're getting to the dispensaries and that we're making sure that they see there's an alternative system that can help them with their inventory, that can help them understand the client's health, as well as being able to triage qualifying conditions and reducing the client's symptoms. And the marketing will be, uh, a lot of the marketing will be centered on the dispensary because the dispensary is kind of the hardest sell for us at this point. We have uh, several hundred patients enrolled in the app, uh, as well as physicians. Uh, we're working only with uh, three dispensaries right now. So that's what we need to, to get more. And again, we're testing, but that's what we're planning on uh, expanding the most is going to the dispensaries. Okay. Thank you both very much. That, that went by very quickly. I'm sure we all have a lot more questions for you. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm determined to keep us on a schedule today. We'll see how well that goes. Well, thank um, you very much. Thank, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank, thank you. you. Judges, if you could quickly uh, write down your notes. Um, I'm going to introduce our, our next entrepreneur. It's Zach Sekar, which I'm sure I'm also not pronouncing right. He's the co-founder and CEO of Polar Extracts. Uh, it's a B2B cannabinoid manufacturing technology startup based in LA. Zach is an experienced community builder and also founded Startup Coil, as well as several conference series, including LA Joint Ventures, LA Tech Happy Hour, and more. Uh, welcome, Zach. Thanks, Julie. Yeah. And also, um, thanks for Brad for uh, putting this on again. This has been wonderful. Um, there's been some really amazing speakers. I'm, uh, I'm somewhat of a newbie to the hemp and cannabis world, and I've, I've felt particularly welcome amongst uh, hemp people and, and industry people. So, um, yeah, just I hope we uh, get to stay connected to all the people who have spoken and who are about to present, because I know we've got some really cool companies coming up. Um, I'm going to keep this brief, because I like the Q&A part better. And we've got such a, a great investor panel that that seems silly to listen to me talk. Um, but briefly, I'd like, just like to speak about what I think is the most interesting thing um, in the, I guess, hemp sub-segment, uh, which is the phytocannabinoids. Um, most people are particularly familiar with CBD. That's, you know, the big guy. Um, and really, it's because it's the, 
the most studied and the most uh, accessible of the non-THC cannabinoids. Um, and as, the, as Elaine just mentioned, there are projections um, from BDS, for example, of over $20 billion in uh, uh, market share and market value in the coming years. So and that's not a secret. Everyone's heard that CBD is booming uh, and farmers heard that too. So they ramped up hemp production largely because of the you know, promise of CBD gold rush, um, which sounds great, except for the fact that um, particularly as you know, Bob Hogan was explaining, the infrastructure hasn't actually matured yet in a, an industry that essentially only began to exist in the beginning of 2019. So what's happening is, yeah, they've ramped up uh, hemp production, thousand acre plus farms are, are popping up, but they don't have enough demand yet or enough processing ability yet. There is a lot of interesting stuff, as a lot of our speakers have talked about, in plastics uh, and hempcrete and using the fiber for fabrics. And those are very interesting things as well. Um, most of the recent explosion in growth has been the high CBD hemp crop. And unfortunately, as you can see from these um, news articles, a lot of it's just rotting in fields. And that's because of the big processing bottleneck. No matter how much hemp you uh, grow, it's not gonna end up in a bottle of CBD oil. There's something in between. You've gotta be able to extract it. So the problem is clearly uh, the bottleneck that's in processing. And uh, at least the way that we see it, the solution is clearly industrial scale, concentrate manufacturing. Briefly so that everyone's on the same page as far as terminology, processing and extraction are, is what happens between growing and harvesting the, the green plant on a hemp farm and then manufacturing that into a CBD product for the consumer. Essentially what you're doing is taking out uh, a number of molecules that you want and leaving everything else behind. And when people say extraction, they're usually talking about the very first stage of the whole processing um, timeline, which is when you go from an actual plant biomass into some sort of concentrate. And a lot of times, especially uh, again, as some of our speakers were mentioning today, things are kind of trending towards that whole plant extract to where some of these additional um, isolation techniques are not even desired by many end products because they want the, the more full plant broad spectrum. Um, but again, no matter what end product you're doing, you've got to start with extraction. You've got to take out the molecules you want out of that big green plant. Um, so this is us. I'm Zach, uh, as I mentioned, uh, of a specialty um, in community building and building sales teams. Uh, and my co-founder, Sean, is a PhD rocket scientist um, who has a lot of uh, experience in prototyping, thermal engineering, and he has specific expertise in the cryogenic ethanol extraction process, um, not only in the cannabinoid space, but also uh, in botanicals and in alcohol production. So again, we believe the solution it's industrial scale concentrate manufacturing and how we're going about it is the cryogenic ethanol extraction process because not only is it quality, um, efficient, safe, but compared to the few other ways that might hit those categories, it's also scalable. This is, uh, again, as some of our speakers mentioned today, um, bringing technology from existing industries, uh, wh whether that's energy, food, pharmaceuticals, uh, or uh, cosmetics, and plugging those in and adapting them for phytocannabinoid extraction. One way that we're tackling this uh, to better partner with our farms, uh, but also to scale up without having to go from zero to a giant factory overnight, is using a modular and decentralized approach for that first stage of extraction. We can build extraction laboratories um, that are largely plug and play inside of shipping containers or even uh, RV style trailers. This allows us to avoid um, choosing ahead of time a very large and expensive plot of real estate. Gives us some flexibility on which uh, growing partners we want to work with. Uh, and it also lets us not only in the, the hemp CBD side of things, but um, on the more cannabis marijuana side of things, as states open up their uh, regulations, we can have laboratories already built on wheels that can be trucked right in and be the first people in, the, in whichever state wants to come on next. Um, because it is a large market, obviously there's a financial reason for us wanting to take on this challenge. Um, as you can see, estimates of if we've got a, about a thousand kilograms of normal 
concentration CBD hemp. Uh, we can expect margins between 100 and 250,000 from that. Um, that depends on market conditions, but also the end product. If it's a you know a full spectrum concentrate versus a you know 99% tea free isolate. Uh, and our revenue models uh, include both purchasing biomass processing it and wholesaling it to manufacturers, but also contract processing, in which case we never actually take possession of any of the, the hemp or the concentrate, but simply do the, the work and get the cash even more efficiently. Um, based on simply scaling up using these modular units, uh, our projections show us uh, eclipsing $40 million by year three. Um, and that's really what we're doing. Even though we're very much a technology company, we're funding it through the fact that the high margins in CBD allow us to quickly reach profitability so that hopefully this first fundraise is the only time we have to take dilutive capital. Uh, right now we're raising up to $1.4 million uh, as a full you know, equity raise. Uh, me, by that I mean, I know some people are doing things with like a capped ROI, that is not the case in our seed round here. We would love for our uh, angel and VC seed investors to participate with us in what we anticipate being at least a 50X return. And the reason we need the money is largely to uh, fabricate the equipment itself. Um, even though we've scaled down to those modular units, building a factory is still somewhat capital intensive. And yeah, that's all I really wanted to say uh, on screen at least. Um, but I'd love okay. to hear some questions. Thank you. Yeah, we have three, uh, just under three minutes for that. Who, who on our panel has, um, has looked at this part of the supply chain that has a question? Seth, welcome Seth. We missed you on the introduction. Hi Seth. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, sorry, sorry. I got in a little, got, got online a little late. I was listening. Um, uh, we've been involved with uh, several um, uh, processor failures uh, recently mm -hmm. and, and note that um, others, for example, um, Elemental in Kentucky, uh, Gencana that we worked on, and, uh, and other, other processors, uh, specialty oil extractors in South Carolina uh, are, are having a tough time. And, and one of the problems is that the farmers of the hemp don't have money to pay processors. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so I'm kind of wondering, mm -hmm. in terms of your overall capitalization, how far you're going to get with a million and a half dollars. Sure. Uh, well, um, one, one, one more we, we actually purchase biomass. That's one of the options. So the farmers, we can purchase hemp biomass from farmers. So we could pay them rather than, than them paying us. Okay. And then as part of the fundraise, the other piece of it is if you're going to buy the hemp and produce the products, uh, to what extent are you going to develop a, a marketing department to actually sell the end product after you've produced it? Somewhat. I've uh, currently we're allocating more uh, resources into sales than marketing um, because it's we'd rather go after uh, manufacturers that can buy pretty large bulk orders rather than we're not trying to actually create consumer products ourselves. We don't want to compete with our customers. So it's, it's definitely skewed more towards um, professional sales team than it is uh, general marketing. It's, we're fine if uh, no one ever hears of our brand. Uh, the analogy I like to use is we're kind of like whoever the heck it is out there processing uh, corn into corn syrup and selling it at Coca-Cola. I don't know his name, but he's probably a billionaire. Thank you. Yeah. Good stuff. Thank you very much, Zach. Um, judges, go I have ahead. a question for oh, Zach. Sorry. Sure. Go ahead, Jay. Uh, I like the idea of those mobile units. I think mm -hmm. that allows you to achieve scalability quicker because you're bringing it to them. Right. I'm just curious about the cost of one of those units. It seems like it would be rather, uh, you're not going to have a fleet of them at the get-go, right? So have you scoped out the cost to build a mobile unit? Yes, um, we're estimating roughly $400,000. Um, and we hope that'll go down once we you know, kind of get better at it and do them at scale. But yeah, the idea is to be able to start with just one. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the, the other thing is being able to manufacture them in a kind of central location in one of those shipping containers allows us to keep that kind of machine shop manufacturing place separate from any more you know, chemistry laboratory type 
processing facility where they don't really mix that well. Good stuff. Thank you. All right. Um, thanks a lot, Zach. Thank you. Judges scribble away because we're moving on. Next up, we have Shane Duell. He's the president and CEO of the US We Channel. So Shane's building America's next large niche broadcasting network and media company, and he's launched the US We Channel, which is the first public access cannabis TV network. Initially, it launched with just 20 hours of content and now has over 150,000 Roku app installations and recently launched its Apple TV and Apple web porter. It's really exciting. Uh, Shane, welcome. I don't see you anywhere, right? There he is. Shane, uh, Shane, you gotta put your microphone on. You're on mute. <laughs> He's got a green screen. I don't know if you guys see that yet, so I'm very excited no, to see what's gonna happen. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me now? And hopefully my voice isn't duplicated because I'm also mic'd up here as well as holding the, the red mic. Yeah, you do have some interference. Okay. How about now? Same. Really? You, you've got a squeak going on. I don't know how you can. There you go. OK. Close I'm enough. I'm going to just go then. Let's do it. So, <laughs> yeah. So first of all, thank you very much, everybody, for watching. I was going to put something neat on here, but I thought it'd be kind of cooler that you guys could actually see that we have a studio. Uh, I couldn't get much of the studio in here. Um, but from here, you know, we're going to be producing news shows. On the other side over there, there's cooking shows that's going to be happening. There's a sound booth over there that you can't see. Uh, and there's a whole slew of lights that, of course, we can't turn the camera to right now. Um, so let me start off by saying thank you, uh, everybody, for, for coming and listening and participating. Can you hear the construction? <laughs> Outside, they're doing construction. So this is, a, this is a perfect time, by the way, for us to go on um, and deal with some issues. But uh, so thank you very much to uh, all, everybody on. I wanted to uh, you know, present US Wheat Channel to you guys because everything that you're doing, every single thing that you guys have presented, every company you're investing in, except maybe Zach's, who doesn't want to be known, <laughs> belongs on US Wheat Channel. We are the solution to what the advertising problem is in the cannabis industry. So let's not use the mic and let's address this because I'm kind of a stand up and move around kind of guy. So what have we done? I'm gonna go ahead and walk over here and I'm gonna put up my pitch real quick so that we can get to it. I'm gonna run through it and then you guys can ask questions, all right? So let's do this. Allow me to share this screen. Boom. And that one right there. Okay, hopefully this will get bigger. There we go. Can everyone see what I'm seeing? Julie? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so what we are is a cannabis lifestyle TV network. Um, you know, there have been other competitors out there, and what you'll notice in most of them is that they're trying to sort of push, well, a lifestyle onto the broader spectrum of cannabis lifestyle. You know, look at all the people in our panel here today. I don't see, you know, a lot of people wearing red, gold, and green. I don't see a lot of people with a, a ton of tattoos and all the stereotypical things that people, you know, say and advertise in cannabis. So let's go through and kind of figure out what we're doing next. So with, with US Weed Channel, what we're doing is we just built a small viewer base. We're about to take on our first advertisers. And in a short time, we'll be holding holdings of all sorts of different companies inside the cannabis sector. Now, let's go and see what's next. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so we've got a problem. Right now in advertising in cannabis and, and hemp and CBD, right now the content's a little scattered. You see a lot of people putting stuff out on YouTube. You've got a lot of people doing their Zoom meeting. You've got this, that, and the other. But there's no consolidated place where everybody can be seen. So what ends up happening is somebody makes this great piece of production, whatever it is, and then all of a sudden it goes away. And it doesn't get any more attention because there's no new programs around it to bring attention to it. 
So now, social media, obviously everybody who's dealt with that, you've seen the shutdowns on YouTube, Facebook, you name it. That's, you know, we've done the negotiations here at US Wheat Channel. We have a branded Roku app. We have a branded Apple app. We're on the web at USWC TV. We have executed and we are on. Now, current advertising restrictions, that goes right into what's happening right now, literally. You, you just can't have a cannabis business and go out and advertise on the Super Bowl, no matter how much money you have. Nice try, Mr. Hoban. <laughs> now, the next thing is, a lot of our content out there is just horrible. You got two dudes in a bong, you got scantily clad women. You know, this is wrong, people. This is not where we all want to go. So now let's keep going, try to save some time. Now, what's our solution? Well, US Weed Channel, a trusted source, we won't go away once you build your following with us and you put yourself, your name on a show. How do you differentiate yourself? You put your name on a show. You say, this show is brought to you by. And now that's how we work. And now what market are we going for? Right there, 42.9 million. That is a number that is on the US Census from 2012. That's how many people in America said that they smoke cannabis on a regular basis. Now, why is that number important? Because it's 14.9% or 14.2% of the American population. So what are we building at US Weed Channel? We're building the next niche TV network. What does that mean? Well, we've got 12% of America is black, 17% of America is Latin. They both have niche TV networks that are worth over $10 billion with a B. We're at the 14%, we're right in the middle. We are building that niche TV network. Market size, we just talked about the 42.9 million. That's just in America, and I'm pretty sure people around the globe smoke pot and use weed and want to use CBD and or hemp products. By the way, U.S. Weed Channel is already viewed in 141 countries. Oh, time, sorry, I'm trying to hurry. <laughs> Don't give me a soapbox. We have a few competitors. Most of those are already gone. Product development, we're already running. We're up and running. Check us out. We're streaming right now at uswc.tv. Check out your own show. Sales and distribution, it just started. We just brought on our first ever business development people. We're not simply a place to go and show your video. We have partners. We take your video and go everywhere. We can take any one video and almost make sure that you get a million impressions. How does that compare to anything that you're doing in cannabis advertising right now? Trade show, magazine, billboard, I'll blow it away. We already have 151,000 installs on our beta test. We've done that with no influencers, no marketing money, and very little new content. That's how radical we are because we choose the right content. <laughs> now, this is, this is proof in choosing the right content. Right here, we've got the age brackets. Look at that, even, even Steven all the way around. Gender, show me another cannabis advertising outlet that is literally 50-50. You can't. Let's keep going here. Intellectual property. There's been a few articles written about US Weed Channel. We're literally probably the only openly cannabis entity that has intellectual property. Hey, Shane, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut you off right there because I guarantee you that the judges have some questions for you. Yep, uh, okay, we've got a big team and we've got production partners. Go for it. <laughs> Julie, I have one. Yeah. Um, so Shane, uh, I know you have competitors. So let me ask you this question. What are the top two or three objective reasons that make you different than your competitors? Not subjective, but objectively, what are the top two or three reasons that make you different than your competitors? Well, you sort of broke up there, but I think what you're wanting is what, what sort of differentiates us, right? Uh, objectively, objectively, yeah. The two or three objective okay. reasons. Most, mostly is that uh, it's our programming. So while other people have been willing to uh, put up programming that is risky, uh, or maybe what I call puts us two steps back. Um, we prefer to have programming that invites everybody. Literally, if your grandma walked in the room when you were watching the USB channel, you could invite her to watch with you. It's a great answer. Do we have a real quick question from someone else? We've got a minute left. Okay, hey, well, then with my minute, I'm going to address what you guys wanted to hear earlier. Watch this. Okay, first of all, thank you, Brad Turner. Thank you, Jim, Anna, and Riley for, for the whole talk about influencers. Because people, when you get an influencer, where do they go? In your TV show on US Weed Channel. That's where they go. Okay, next thing. Everybody, love you for being here. Somebody talked about these things right here. 
Is US Weed Channel timely? Yes. Is it innovative? Yes. Programming, options, everything. Is it in use? Check us out right now. We're streaming this show. So it's executed and the, uh, the product market share. Well, at 42.9 million American alone, if we got 10,000 subscriptions a month, it would last for the next 100 years. So the market size is almost indefinite. Thank um, you, Shane. I've got to cut you off now, just to be fair. That was, that was fantastic. Of course. But, Anybody um, has any questions, just get in touch with me. Trust me, they're all good answers. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's exciting to know that we're all on, uh, on your channel going live. Right so now. very cool. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Um, OK, judges, if you can, can go ahead and uh, take your notes. And uh, we're going to move on. Our next entrepreneur, I have no background on him, Matthew Stockard, founder and chief executive of Chef Matt. And uh, let's just see what he has to say. Welcome, Matt. Hey, how's it going? How are you? All right. Good stuff. Welcome. Most definitely. Um, some of you may know me, some of you may not. Um, I go by Chef Matt, um, catered uh, a lot of the top cannabis events in the industry over the last few years. Um, I own a manufacturing company. We manufacture food products on the cannabis side. We manufacture everything food-based, basically, from you know gummies to coffee creamer, bread, anything you can think of. We're trying to be the go-to company for food products and the uh, CBD and cannabis space. Uh, and um, I don't know where that noise is coming from, but yeah. Any questions? Um, any questions? Can I'm gonna actually start us off. Can you tell me like a little more specifically? Um, you're catering. Tell me about the business model. You're catering. You've got products. How many people do you have? Do you have? Are you revenue positive? That kind yes. of stuff. Yes. Yeah, we're revenue positive. Uh, we white label for about four companies right now. Have a couple more purchase orders uh, that we're dealing with right now. Um, and the goal is to focus on manufacturing. The catering and stuff is not, you know, a big deal. But that's how we got started and you know built a brand by catering by using our own products and now it's all about the products and building you know a product company and is it just california or are you nationwide uh we're, we're nation well state statewide we're shipping you know lots of states um licensed in uh oklahoma for cannabis and doing the licensing there in california and looking to do licensing deals in other states versus going and acquiring the license there you know, save a lot of money by doing licensing deals, taking the same um, recipe and format and system and you can find it in other states. And are you looking for funding? Yes, we are. You we're want to tell me a little more yeah, about? Yeah, yeah, we're, yeah, we're looking to raise about a million, a million bucks. We're looking for like, you know, 600 to go more towards cannabis and like 400 to go towards the CBD side of things. Okay. Judges, who wants to jump in? How many people on staff at the company, Matt? You mentioned you had operations outside of California. So across the U.S., how big is the team? Well, we have 12 here in California. And in Oklahoma, the staff there, it just depends on, you know, what the company, we did a licensing deal with the company in uh, Oklahoma. And I'm not quite sure how many employees that they have there on a day-to-day, -day, but I would imagine anywhere about 10. Matt, uh, Nick here. Thanks for at least presenting here. I, I like companies that kind of start from one thing and go to another, especially like the consumer package side. Um, California, Oklahoma, very different markets when it comes to like 9,000 cultivators. Like Oklahoma's kind of a mess when it comes to a regulatory medical program, but which is good for your company because you can pretty much make freezer pops or anything. But help me understand if you're doing the catering and you don't have these licenses, you're physically like possessing the cannabis or infusing certain goods. Is it just for like private event catering or to actually be, be sold as a, like a, a package good in a dispensary? Again, we're not talking about catering at all. Catering was what, how we got started in, in the industry, but we're not really catering anymore. Now we're a product company. We manufacture like olive oil, honey, you know, peanut butter and jelly, you know, all, you know, ketchup, mustard, stuff like that now. 
So we've moved on from catering. So catering is like not even a thing anymore for us. So then you're infusing, I kind of like this, I've never heard of an infused mustard, but like, so cannabis infused products like culinary additions that would then be sold in dispensaries or? Correct. So then Correct. from a licensing standpoint, did you like, by chance, like make like a Delaware C corporation that owns the intellectual property to like structure those licensing deals? Those are awesome. Like where there's brand licensing, they have a licensing contract, licensing agreement, reoccurring revenues. But you want to make sure like if you don't have the license, like you don't like touch the product like with your company. Correct. So how, how do you do the, the licensing? What's your plans there? So I kind of, we just, we kind of do like an intellectual property, you know, where I own the recipe. And, you know, I go in there and share the recipe with them and show them how I want it done. And I own the recipe. And I usually do a non-compete you know, for five years that they aren't able to make, you know, anything close to what we doing for the next five. Super. Thank you. Hey, Matt, can you, you're, you're clearly the visionary. Can you talk a little, little bit about your team? Like who's taking care of all the accounting and financials? Who's doing operations? Who's taking care of all that legal licensing things that Nick was just talking about? No, but definitely I have a, you know, a, a team of lawyers the company that I hire that takes care of the legal stuff. Um, I kind of handle a lot of the operations, you know, in day to day because we haven't scaled that far yet, but with funding, that's going to help us be able to scale where I can, you know, bring in more quality and more qualified people to help out with certain areas of the business that I'm not necessarily familiar with. But, you know, manufacturing, you know, I uh, would like to bring in somebody that kind of specializes in manufacturing on a large scale and somebody who's more familiar with, you know, licensing deals. But as far as like creating recipes or products, I mean, I could do that all day long. Pretty sure you're, you're going to about to be slammed with a bunch of emails after this presentation. <laughs> so <laughs> any other questions from our judges? I've got, I've got a quick one. Uh, thank you. Chef Matt, um, I want to understand other than, you know, your sales channel, other than your website, which I've been on, which, which looks really great. And by the way, I'd love to try some of that habanero honey. That looks really good. The cinnamon, cinnamon honey looks really good, but I want to understand the sales channel. Is it just through your website? How else, how else are the products being sold? And to follow up on that and some of the other uh, questions that, that have been posed, how, how are the products formulated? Um, you know, is it, is it something that, that, you'd find uh, appetizing um, and then decide to go ahead and, and bring to market. Can you describe that process a bit? Yeah, um, we figure out a product and then we have to make sense. Like, is it going to sell to the masses just because I think it's a good idea doesn't necessarily mean it's going to sell. And then I have to figure out the dosing side of it. Is it, you know, I get with a formulator and say, hey, I want to infuse the honey. You know, is it going to be water soluble? Is it going to be distillate? Is it going to be uh, isolated, if you know what I mean. So there's a process for every uh, recipe that's created. You know, we have to figure out which, how we're going to do it and which method is going to work the best for it. And then as far as marketing, uh, we just signed on to a 22 uh, distribution for 22 stores. Uh, we're doing direct to consumer. We're doing affiliate marketing. We're doing uh, celebrity influencing. Uh, I've spoke at almost a shitload of expos, you know, I'm at every expo. I mean, I've just kind of been everywhere for the last few years. Well, the chat channel is blowing up about from people who've been to your events and say the food was amazing. Oh, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've got time for another question. I just have, I just have a quick one. Uh, Sh Chef Matt, first off, kudos on everything you've done so far. That's great. Um, let me ask you this, uh, like what's like the three or five year goal? Um, like what, like, and I, cause you could have a lot of different branches. Like do you have a, a certain goal for three years or five years for, for your company or your brand or where you see yourself going? I, I do the goal in three to five years is be the go-to brand, the Betty Crocker, the go-to brand for cannabis or CBD, you know, the brand that, you know, um, everybody trusts like, Right now in the cannabis space, there's a thousand cannabis chefs, but nine times out of 10, the average cannabis chef is making those oils themselves. Well, the Chef Matt brand is trying to, you know, build a brand that chef, other chefs can use. The brand is trusted. And that way we take the dosing and everything off of your hands and you can just focus on cooking. And that goes for 
you know, the other chefs and people at home, we take care of the dosing for you, if that makes sense. Thank you for sharing that. Appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. Excellent. Um, Matt, did we miss anything? Or, or you think we covered it all? I think we covered it all for the, for the most part. You know, all you can get on five minutes is, you know. Right? <laughs> no, I do know. I have, I've had to do it too. It's, it's tough. It's tough. You did a great job. Um, and we're right on schedule still, everyone. So thank you very much, Chef Matt. Thank you, guys. <laughs> didn't, think we, didn't think I'd be able to keep this schedule. So I thought we, I would have blown it by now already. So um, guys, go ahead and take your notes down. Um, and I'll introduce our, our next presenter is Coleman Beal. He's the CEO of Bastcor and is one of the co-founders and original seed investors of Bastcor. Coleman has over 15 years of professional experience working in the finance industry. He's worked across multiple disciplines, including corporate and commercial banking, investment banking, fixed income, and banking and payments. Prior to Bascor, he was the CFO of a high growth VC company. He also found a privately held eyewear company. The company was founded in 2014. It's pre-revenue, three employees, and has already raised 2.5 million. Welcome, Coleman. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Can everybody hear me okay? Absolutely. Great. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Well, I'm excited to have this opportunity. It's, uh, my, my name is Coleman Beal, and I'm currently the CEO of Bascor. We are an industrial hemp processing company. The company was founded in 2014, and from the beginning and since inception, um, as is today, our focus has been on the stalks of the hemp plants, um, whereby we focus on producing fiber and wood. Um, myself, along with my longtime friend and business partner, McMillan Arrington, provided all the seed capital back in 2014 after the 14 Farm Bill was passed to launch Bascor. So the, the key market problem right now with industrial hemp um, as it relates to getting into industry is a lack of processing. It is the choke point and the number one issue and it's the problem that Bascor right now is currently solving. So there's a lot of exponential growth potential here. If you think about all the farmland here in the United States and were to just take 1% of the current farmland, it equates to a massive need for processing. And with industrial hemp acreage growing year over year, that need is only going to continue. So Bascor is unique in the sense that we source all of our supply domestically. We process everything domestically and all of our customer base is located domestically as well. So we feel like we are very well positioned to thrive in this COVID-19 world that we're all living in right now. <laughs> so the hemp plant has a lot of advantages to it and a lot of products can be made from hemp. And so at Bascor, what we really do is we, we produce the key inputs being fiber and wood that are gonna go into all of these products. And currently we have proven products and we have proven markets. And so our solution has been designed and custom built in house. It is a processing, a full processing system. We have two patents pending and one of the things that really separates us is that we are able to produce a very high quality product at a cost competitive price. So we're excited to, uh, to announce that we've really begun our commercial operations at our new facility located in the central part of the state of Alabama. It's located in Montgomery, Alabama, and the building has some unique history behind it and it originally powered the first citywide electrified trolley system in the United States. So we're really using the energy that was created in that building to really be the leader in this new industry. So at Bascor, we have a very robust pipeline of customers, and this ranges all the way from small artisan customers to large multi-billion dollar corporation. And this is really a result of our research and development that we've, that we've done over the last five and a half years. We also have a research and development arm, and the focus of that arm is to use our materials, primarily our wood, to solve an even larger problem, and that is to create a product to replace plastics, which is obviously a massive issue right now, and one that we're, the, one that we're excited to be able to help solve. 
So this is a, a, a snapshot of our pro forma financials, and this just assumes one system. We have plans to add multiple systems as well as increase the capacity of our current system with this capital raise. So we've raised approximately two and a half million dollars to date. We're currently seeking $3 million and we have an oversubscription option available up to $5 million depending on market demand. So this is our current team. Um, I feel very fortunate that I've got a team of just great people that have a very um, robust background with different industry experiences and that certainly helped contribute to our success over the years. So in conclusion at BASCOR, we, uh, we have a first mover advantage in the marketplace. We have a blue ocean opportunity. Uh, we, we really don't see anybody standing next to us right now. We also feel that um, it's important for us to be able to have a, uh, a positive economic impact on the community that we serve. So we have the supply chain in place. We have the process. We have the pipeline of customers. And so now we hope that you will join us on this journey um, to, to make BASCOR a success. So with that, I thank you for your time and um, ready to answer any questions. That's fantastic. That's how you get it done in five minutes. Really impressed with that. Um, Very good. Uh, does someone want to go first here? Just let me know. Um, yeah, I'll jump in. Hey, Coleman, that was great, man. Really enjoyed the presentation there. It's interesting. Nice to see um uh morgan paxi on your board a very smart man as michael knows and uh that goes a long way for a lot of people on this video i mean he's he's somebody who knows these businesses as well as anybody my question for you on the competition side given the fact that you can only go so far with it right now right i mean there's a lot that has to happen from a demand standpoint before you can even get to that supply you're addressing one local area which is probably a really smart thing to do i think Talk about competition though, and, and is that healthy? And when do you think you would see competition? Um, and give us some timelines as the next 12 months may unfold in your business in the hip world. Yeah, I mean, right now, um, we're, just not seeing, uh, we're just not seeing a lot of competition come online. I mean, our business is capital intensive. It is hard work. Um, we've learned that, and so it's, 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 it's not easy. And so um, we, uh, the, the, the materials and actual products being produced right now. I just, from the call, I was just on a phone, um, a phone call 30 minutes before I hopped on this call with a, with a large, um, with a large customer. And, and they, they reiterated the same thing. They said, I, we just haven't, we're not seeing any material produced from at least in the U S um, any, any, anybody else other than basketball right now. Appreciate that. Well, look forward to seeing your growth, man. It's really, really a good presentation. Be curious to hear Michael's questions if he has any too. Thank uh, you. My, yeah. yeah uh, Michael, you go and John, go ahead. Sure. So I will disclose that beside as investors in Bascor, as you saw my colleague Morgan Paxi on the, uh, on the presentation there. Uh, but Coleman, I was wondering if you could just talk to, you know, when you talk about the pipeline, maybe, uh, if you could talk to what you're hearing from some of these companies in terms of finding different solutions, you know, you talk about the uh, apparel companies, industrial conglomerates, maybe generally speaking, what are you hearing from a lot of these large companies who are trying to solve for uh, uh, their processing? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, um, you know, I would say that if you look back 12 to 18 months, even, I think that people were interested in help, although, at least from a large corporate level, um, the question has always been, there's, this thing is so new and so nascent that, you know, it's help, it's going to take some time, right? And over the last, I would say, 12 months and even the last six months, the conversations have changed dramatically. The, um, the end consumer is inquiring about industrial help. And so, hence, you know, it, there, there is a lot more focus on, um, bringing supply and bringing product to market. And I'm hearing it from brands time and time again. I mean, these are all the way from small companies to multi-billion dollar corporations. I mean, it is, it is, it is a conversation that is um, becoming more and more frequent and, and, and from what I'm seeing. 
Thank you. And Seth, you had a question? Microphone. You're muted. Go ahead, Seth. Okay, here I am. Sorry. Um, yeah, good presentation. What, what is the, the nature of your contracts? Are they, um, do you expect them to be long term or sort of, you know, purchase single purchase orders? Or are you going to see uh, streams of income from the same customers uh, in terms of the predictability of your revenue? Sure. I, I think right now we're in a pretty fortunate position in that, um, in that we have, we have um, optionality with the way we want to structure our, um, our revenue streams, meaning um, if we wanted to enter into a contract with one company, they could certain, um, they could certainly probably take all of our supply at least for the foreseeable future. But at the same time, um, you know, I think we, so for, we can we can structure shorter term kind of just purchase orders as we go as well. So we're we're in that evaluation process now, and um, you know we'll hopefully have more to announce um, in the not too distant future. Thank you. Can I can I ask quickly about are, are there any limits to what types of hemp that uh, that Bascor can process? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, absolutely. I mean, everything that we process is um, is a fi or fiber specific varieties. Um, so that's where we found to be the most efficient and in, um, in terms not only efficiency, but in terms of quality as well. And how does that translate into your supply in, in order for processing and talking about one of the bigger pain points of the hemp industry being the fact that there aren't enough processors can you just talk a little bit about the fact that the challenge is also in the type of strains? Um, and I think I read in the deck that you're going to be working with farmers specifically. Are you going to be providing uh, seeds or how is that going to work? We have, we have provided, um, well, I should say we have helped source seeds in the past for farmers. Um, it's certainly, um, it, it, it's you know, not something that we, um, that we require necessarily, although we do require knowing, um, uh, you know, having visibility and traceability into our into the ultimate source of that. But um, you know, at the end of the day, we are we are not farmers; we are processors. Although we have worked with um, farmers over the last several years with specific uh, fiber crops, and we've learned a lot from that. And so, being the fact that um, this is still early and there aren't a lot of farmers with um, not only hemp experience but fiber specific experience it puts us in a position where we need to work with them and and educate them from what we know and what we've seen um, in terms of best practices excellent coleman thank you very much um feels like you guys have a lot more to talk about i should mention that after all the uh closing announcements there is a networking room if you all want to virtually converge there afterwards. And I know we've got a, someone can post it into the, to the chat window. Um, so excellent. So we're almost halfway through here. Um, I'm gonna introduce our next presenter. And this is Alex, who is the co-founder and chief scientific officer of Levadora Biotechnology. Alex, I'm, I'm not even gonna try for your last name. I know you're gonna, uh, it's, just better you can introduce yourself to everyone. But Alex received his doctorate in biochemistry from Baylor, um, focused on muscles and how they become functional. Uh, before Levadora, he was the director of metabolic engineering at uh, Verdesign, where he guided research teams on the production of dicarboxylic acids. Alex now focuses his efforts on making cannabinoids with the goal of producing them as high quality, pure, and consistent as possible. Um, the Levadora started in 2018, a uh, pre-revenue company, four, four employees, and 330K already raised. Welcome, Alex. Thank you, Julie. Can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Yep. And thank you to Brad and the organizers and all the judges. Um, so I'll, I'll get started again. My name is Alex Utagalo. I, I, you didn't try, Julie, but you should have given it a shot. I mean, just for I fun. Uh, just <laughs> anyway. Uh, and uh, I am the CSO of Levadura Biotechnology, 
And today I'm going to tell you about how we will be the go-to provider of cannabinoids and cannabinoid biosynthesis technology for the next generation of cannabis. Let's start with our team, Matt Engler, Jose LaPlaza, myself, and Brian Kahn. Uh, Jose and myself bring the technical expertise of yeast, genetic engineering, and industrial biotech, while Matt and Brian lead business development, strategy, and finance. The four of us have worked together extensively before and have taken an industrial biotech process from concept to commercialization. So what are we going to do for the cannabis market? The cannabis market will be huge and the non-flower market segments like concentrates and edibles are exploding with each segment expected to be worth billions of dollars in the next two years. Both of these markets rely on a consistent and high quality source of purified cannabinoids. Furthermore, pharmaceutical applications of cannabis are expected to be worth over 5 billion in the next seven years. Unfortunately, there's a problem. Consistency in chemical composition is one of the greatest challenges to plant-based drug development. This leads to the question, how will the market efficiently source pure and consistent cannabinoids uh, for the market? Now, I think we all agree that the cannabis plant is amazing and provides benefits unlike any other plant. However, as a means of cannabinoid production, there's lots of room for improvement. The whole process takes several months with growing being the rate limiting step. This is a labor and energy intensive process requiring a large footprint, which if you're outdoors is subject to the weather and normal agriculture related environmental issues. When it comes to extraction and purification, there are numerous substances that need to be removed, mold, lipids and waxes, pesticides, heavy metals, and aflatoxins just to start. The end result is an often inconsistent cannabinoid mixture based on the plant and quality of the crop. Levadura solves all these problems. Our expertise lies in our ability to genetically engineer yeast for a fermentation process. Each engineered yeast will produce one cannabinoid in a one week fermentation and purification cycle. Production will require a small footprint and will be a sterile and highly controlled process in fermentation tanks. I, sh I show you an example of what a tank might look like and its dimensions. All this without the known plant-based contaminants. One of the key components of a technology company is its intellectual property. We have recently filed a US patent to protect the core of our technology shown below. The key advantage of our approach is how we engineer yeast to convert the input, in our case, vegetable oil, to the output a cannabinoid, and I'll elaborate on that here. Any kind of vegetable oil is composed of triglycerides. Each triglyceride is composed of glycerol and three fatty acids. Any kind, uh, it, it's the fatty acid component that is valuable for our technology, which I show you here with the tail portion highlighted in red. Our yeasts, shown here as this Pac-Man guy with an empty belly, consume fatty acids, and our real special sauce is our ability to engineer these yeasts to not consume the red portion, because this is the starting point for cannabinoid biosynthesis. The yeast cells then take the bits of fatty acids they've consumed, combine them with the red portion and build cannabinoids, like CBGA or THCA that I'm showing you here. In this way, we have developed proof of concept production of CBGA, THCA, and the cannabinoid precursor olivitolic acid. We believe the potential of this technology lies in our ability to control how much of the fatty acid tail we can leave behind to make cannabinoids. For example, the rare cannabinoids of the for all class, THCP or CBDP, which I'm showing you here, have a longer tail shown in green. THC is shown for comparison on the right with a shorter red tail. THCP is found naturally in the plant and has recently been shown to be 33 times more active than, TH3, than THC through binding to the CB1 receptor. Our approach also allows for producing novel cannabinoids. Most plant-based oils are different based on their content of unsaturated fatty acids, like the two examples I'm showing you here. Oleic acid in red with one unsaturation is a major component of canola oil, while linoleic acid in green with two unsaturations is found in sunflower oil. We believe we can engineer our yeast to produce cannabinoids with unusual tails from these fatty acids, which could be great for pharma applications. To provide some context, I'm showing you the structure of adulamic acid, also known as lenabasum, in the drug pipeline of Corbis Pharmaceuticals. Notice its unusual tail. It is at phase two or three clinical trials for several diseases whereby inflammation is a critical component of their pathology. Hey Alex, can I jump in here? Um, sure. 
And then, if I may, I'd love to get some of the judges to ask you some questions. No problem. Um, more about the business model and, and the stage of the company and so forth. Sure. Um, John, we, we haven't heard from you. Do you, do you want to jump in with a question here? I just unmuted my audio. Actually, I'm very intrigued by this. Um, my question is your patents, are they on the yeast itself? Have you developed the actual string? So the, the patents, uh, the, the patent I've just filed, uh, it covers, uh, and this is a general design of a patent in, in this field, is the organism, right. the process, and the product. So that right. it, covers, it covers all aspects of, of the technology from, uh, from end to end, basically. And the, again, so and what I talked about really was, uh, I, what I was trying to describe is really the, the, the technology because it, 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 it uh, leads to okay. not just THC or CBD production, but a, a range of other chemicals or uh, uh, cannabinoids, uh, uh, which are of interest currently in the marketplace uh, beyond just those major compounds that you're aware of. Okay. okay. Now I'm going to say this and please take this with respect, okay? Absolutely. Because if what you have actually works, I don't know if you can hear me right now, my signal has been weak, that's why I, I've been turning off my camera. But what you actually have is actually extremely interesting because for those of us who probably know, many of us probably already know this, that the pharmaceutical chains, the global chains for the pharmaceutical companies has been hugely disrupted by relations with China and India going south. And the need for domestic production is critical. So my, my question to you is, what uh, one or two components do you think that you, you could produce that could substitute for some potential pharmaceutical applications or uh, pharmaceutical products? And, and I know that's a tough question. And if you're not prepared to get into it right now, that's okay. But I, I, I would take that offline. But it would be interesting to hear what you have to say. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure to answer your question. I mean, uh, as far as like, Pharma pharmaceutical applications are concerned, the only cannabinoids in the yeah. marketplace that are approved for pharmaceutical right. applications are, are CBD. Correct. Uh, so uh, uh, it would take some time. It, the, 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 the compounds, the sort of newer compounds like THCP or any of the novel cannabinoids, which obviously I haven't made and, and, and haven't gone through any regulatory process, that's obviously gonna take years to, to, okay. to get into the marketplace. Uh, uh, but so, I think I think what but to answer your question, uh, as far as production is concerned, uh, um, the the ways that we can enter the marketplace with our technology is uh, there are a variety of ways. Uh, we don't have to build our own facility. We can take this technology and move it to a number of tolling facilities that exist in the United States and throughout the world, in order to get production up and running really quickly. Once we've developed the yeast strains. And an actual uh, uh, a production facility, if we were to build it ourselves, uh, would be quite small, and it would fit into about a 10,000 square foot warehouse. So, you know, depending on the actual, uh, uh, or depending on the laws within uh, any of the states or countries that you're talking about, you could set up a small facility quite quickly, uh, although uh, the cost wouldn't necessarily be cheap, but it, it is possible to, to make sure that you're compliant with whatever the current laws are in that state by building that facility right there. And uh, without getting into your specific technical secrets, what do you do to ensure that there aren't mutations in the yeast? Because there can, there can be issues with that. John, sequencing is very cheap nowadays. So literally, I could, if I make a yeast strain, I could throw it and get a sequence in a few weeks and, I, and, and know the complete sequence of that organism from, from head to toe. Uh, uh, and and, and, and that's, that's not a problem at all. Uh, that's actually quite easy to do. So, uh, so as far if as I was Coca-Cola and I said to you that I... I need pharmaceutical grade CBD and I need guaranteed production over a set period of time, right? And I want consistency because I'm Coca-Cola and I can't afford to screw around with hundreds of suppliers. Can you help me? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. I, I, I would love to help you. Uh, um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and any, anyone in Levadura would, would, would give the same answer. Absolutely. Okay. Perfect. That's I, awesome. I apologize for dominating the conversation. I'll move forward. That's quite all right. You've been you've like been on reserve because you you've been quiet till now, so <laughs> totally fine. I'm afraid, Alex, we are out of time though. So sure. thank you so much. Um, really appreciate that. So our next presenter, guys, don't forget to jot down your notes. A lot of a lot of good companies here. Vince uh, Harkowitz. 
I hope. Um, I apologize. CEO and co-founder of Gronetics. Vince is a serial entrepreneur and longtime indoor cultivator. He's been growing indoor plants in controlled environments since 2005. Uh, Vince's career took him to Shanghai, China, where he spent six, six years bringing consumer and industrial products from napkin sketch to mass production. And that's when he realized there was a real need for a drastic shift in the way we produce some of our most vital resources and shift towards open and sustainable practices. Gronetic started in 2015. Um, says here there's only two full-time employees and yet they have almost a million dollars in revenue already and they've raised 1.3 million in capital. Welcome Vince. Thanks, Julie. Uh, checking that the screen is coming through okay and that my audio is coming through as well. All good. All righty. So uh, thanks for that introduction. Yeah, my name is Vince and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Gronetics. And we built the first open smart farming platform to enable hyper-efficient controlled environment growing. Um, this idea came out of this notion that when we're growing plants around sensors and with the price of sensors falling drastically, we can put more sensors into farms and indoor grows that we can automatically link all this data to the plants being grown to do some very sophisticated learning on what leads to growing any crop better. So the challenges facing our industry are falling commodity pricing. And then in terms of leafy greens, that's even more exacerbated, um, growing uh, anything from uh, pharmaceutical crops to vertical food, uh, high, in a highly efficient automated fashion is a brand new field and it is a very exciting one. And I'll, through the course of this presentation, I'll share some of the projects that we've done um, that really prove what's possible with these new technologies. Um, but the challenges are there are very few best practices uh, because it is a new industry. And when you change one element of your cultivation, that changes uh, the entire, uh, every other aspect of how the plant grows. Um, there's also a lack of data-driven cultivation processes with only about 5% of farms um, operating based on data-driven cultivation. Um, and that is a very surprisingly low number, but it's because there are few tools for these uh, cultivators. And then lastly, there's a severe lack of skilled labor. Uh, again, because it's such a new industry, growing in controlled environments, um, there, is, there are not great educational programs uh, uh, training people on how to grow plants efficiently at scale at very high quality. So Gronetics empowers these smart farmers to grow with two to three times less cultivation staff, 30 to 60% higher efficiency, and 10 to 20 times higher precision. Now these are pretty dramatic numbers, but I'll show you projects where we've achieved these, and we believe that these can be exceeded as cultivation scale up. Now, how we actually go about this is we've developed a number of firsts in indoor cultivation, uh, real-time 3D microclimate mapping being one of them understanding how plants and how the environment changes when being grown under lights and with different HVAC and fan configurations is the real challenge that our customers yeah. face. Um, we also integrate with any sensor. With the, my experience in China, I know that there's always gonna be cheaper and better sensors coming onto the market. And it's imperative that cultivators have access to the latest technologies without hardware lock-in. If you have a business model to be staying ahead of the competition continuously, you want to be able to integrate whatever new sensing and controls platform is available. Now, we also include individual plant tracking, individual plant, plant analytics. Um, it, we facilitate multi-facility management, crop logistics and SOP management. We also have variety specific cultivation recipes to help cultivators cultivators understand how one particular crop or strain is doing compared to another and what's leading to those yield outcomes. And we use all this together to feed our AI powered recommendation engine, which is the first of its kind to be able to uh, make control systems actually uh, understand what plant is growing in the control zone and tailor that environmental control to that specific variety at that site for that customer. And that's how we're able to, to deliver quality and consistency at any scale. 
Uh, Gronetics is also the integration leader when it comes to smart farming technologies. Most cultivators are faced with juggling five to seven different subsystems to grow their plants. And that relegates the cultivation director to essentially become a facility manager. And it wastes their time uh, instead of being able to focus on what's leading to crop growth and doing the research that they were hired originally to do, they end up being relegated to pulling all these levers and adjusting them and all in real time. Gronetics takes all these different aspects, integrates them into one operating platform where all the data can be used to easily understand how the environment and how all aspects of control are affecting plant growth, and then to help them to build continuous improvement models in their businesses um, to stay ahead of the competition and to continue to improve and follow where efficiencies are coming from. Um, the first case study I'd like to share is uh, just a fantastic project that we did in Northern California where we, we were able to prove over 90% higher efficiency than traditional first generation indoor growing under HID lights. And this shows how an open platform allows cultivators to take the latest technologies and hyper efficient growing, combine them into true next generation efficient smart farms, helping us to go away from growing plants with coal or doing research, doing indoor cultivation, growing plants with coal and moving towards truly efficient, sustainable alternatives to large scale industrial agriculture, which has its place, but needs to be supplemented by uh, hyper efficient urban and vertical farming. The second case study we have showcases just the sheer amount of data that we can collect for our cultivators. Crops for Health is a hemp cultivator heavily focused on genetics development. And um, by leveraging the Gronetics platform, they're able, to, they're able to automatically link all the environmental data related to growing, all the nutrient data related to growing these different varieties that they're breeding uh, and producing. And then taking that data, and then when they go to sell these uh, varieties to customers in the future, they'll actually have the ideal grow recipes to also deliver to those customers, promising not only will I give you these genetics, but I'll also give you the ideal conditions to produce these cannabinoids that these genetics produce. Okay. Hey, Vince, I'm afraid I'm going to have to cut you off there and let the judges jump in and ask some questions. At sure. This point. Sure, sure, sure. Um, Jay, I feel like this is up your alley. Do you have a question for Vince? What's the amount of raise um, that you're requesting, Vince? We're currently raising 1.1 in preferred equity. Okay. Okay. And uh, these one are the Davids. Do you have um, a question? Controls. Hello. We can. Do you hear Could me, you Repeat that question, Jay. Go ahead, Jay. Yeah, you, I, you answered the question about the raise, but um, with all of this uh, modulation and referencing the, the control environment around the plants, are you doing anything with the soil itself? Absolutely. So we have very sophisticated soil monitoring. Um, and actually, we help cultivators understand which different soil mediums, whether that's cocoa or living soil systems, are leading to the best uh, yields in whatever cultivation system that they're using. With the objective being that you will determine what mix works best for which strain, um, and this can apply to plants outside of the world of cannabis as well. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Hey, Vince, um, just quick question. I saw some of your numbers on future projections in terms of size. What mm -hmm. kind of scale are you doing right now, um, and do you have concerns with scaling in any direction? Um, we're, so our projects are getting larger and larger because it turns out growing at massive scale is one of our sweet spots. It's really where Gronetics um, shines. So the projects we're working on now are over 200,000 square feet going into the million square feet size grows. Thank you. Excellent. Um, David Hess, do you have a question by chance? You look pretty engaged on that. Yes, and uh, full disclosure, uh, we are uh, on the cap table of Gronetics. We've uh, oh. been big supporters of Gronetics for, for quite a long time. And uh, A, I just want to acknowledge it, it's, it's to all the presenters. Everyone's doing a really great job. I know five minutes is not a long time to, to get uh, everything you want to get across. And don't forget, there's networking after, as Julia has mentioned. And I think all of our 
contact info is available uh, on the website as well. And, um, you know, again, uh, or rather my question would be, Vince, can you quickly just um, describe the moat that Chromatics is, is sort of building around itself yeah. and the barrier to entry uh, for, for others that are either in the space right now that, you know, some, some of the unique differences about Chromatics, uh, some of the value add that, that you offer and the barrier to entry uh, for others that are thinking about entering the space. Yeah, sure. So um, we're an open platform, which is to say that we see us being able to help all entrants in the controlled environment space rise quickly. Um, we partner with sensor companies, controls companies, lighting companies to take all their data and facilitate their ability to actually um, give their data context. So th that's a unique position that Gronetics holds right now. And it's been recognized not just in cannabis and hemp production, but also in research institutions and universities where we're working with some of the top indoor ag schools, Michigan State, USDA, um, uh, on developing these first of their kind efficiency models. Um, and so our connection and our positioning in the industry being experienced cultivators and um, building this uh, very open platform to help researchers and leading, uh, leading cultivators in the cannabis space understand really what is leading to those optimal yields uh, is a position we uniquely hold. Thank you very much, Vince. I'm afraid we're out of time and we have to move on. Thank you, judges, for your questions. Thank you. Um, go ahead and jot down your scores. And I'm uh, next up, I'd like to introduce you to Christine Yi. She's the co-founder and chief brand officer of Potley. Chris, uh, it's a premium cannabis and hemp infused ingredients company where she oversees all things brand identity and strategy. She was formerly a strategy manager for Asena Inc's premium segment and management consultant at PwC. Uh, Potley was started in 2018. They have 340,000 in revenues to date, three employees. They've got a quarter of a million uh, raised with another 450 committed. Congratulations on that, Christine, and welcome. Thank you, thanks, Julie. And Thanks to everybody who's listening on. I think I'm second to last to present. So <laughs> I've certainly enjoyed listening to all the other entrepreneurs and getting some good ideas as well. So let me just share my screen and get right into it. Okay. And here we go. So hi everybody, my name is Christine. I'm the co-founder of Potley. And at Potley, we're creating both hemp and cannabis infused ingredients like honey, olive oil, chili oil, apple cider vinegar. We just launched a sriracha earlier this year. And we're all about creating healthy, super integratable uh, edibles products. And for us, nothing is more integratable than ingredients because you can really mimic um, and alter whichever way you would like to be consuming cannabis and truly integrate it into the day-to-day -day things um, that you're already consuming. So for us, we really want to bring the maker out in everybody and really emphasize this intentionality of functional foods. Uh, my co-founder and I are both Asian American and we really grew up with the idea of food as medicine. And so to us, this direct translation of that is potly and creating infused ingredients for really the everyday life. Uh, the two of us met as randomly paired roommates freshman year of college, <laughs> despite the fact that we're both from the East Bay area. Um, we went to BU together and my experience since then has been within the consulting and strategy space, um, working with brands all throughout different stages of their life cycles and helping create growth-based strategies, whether that's initiatives like launching subscription programs or same day deliveries or new product lines. And Felicity, my co-founder is a third generation food manufacturer. So her parents have been in the specialty sauces and spices category for many, many years um, and brings in that supply chain background. And since graduating, she's been working in the food tech space, really thinking through how to get consumers to eat food in new and different ways that they're not used to. So uh, we really balance each other out in that way. Our story really starts with our honey, which is our most popular product today and continues to be our most popular product. Uh, Felicity's father had started beekeeping on behalf of her mom, um, who was asthmatic and was consuming hyperlocal honey to help with her symptoms. And we just found that it was the perfect avenue uh, for cannabis. We 
are constantly thinking about our super conservative Asian immigrant mothers and whether or not we're creating products that even they would like to try. And honey in ancient Ayurvedic medicine is considered yoga bahi or the most powerful vessel for herbal remedies. So to us, that was really the best form factor to go forward. So we started this as a Prashan project in 2017. Both of us were working our respective jobs. Um, in 2018, we got our licenses in manufacturing and distribution, which continues to be one of our key differentiators. Uh, we're a small brand and we're growing, but we're not co-packing or anything. We produce everything ourselves. We have two fully built out manufacturing facilities for both the hemp side of the business and the canvas side of the business respectively. And so uh, we can really own that channel and own our margins as well. Um, our hemp CBD line started in 2018 and we have been growing since then. So we started out cannabis first and have been um, expanding into other avenues. And um, given that we have both our manufacturing and distribution licenses, this really allows us to um, expand really quickly and launch products in a fast way. And we're all about sourcing local ingredients from California. Uh, we think that consumers have this perception of edibles where if something doesn't taste bad, that means it's good. And we fundamentally think that that's wrong and that people should have a higher standards for the foods that they're putting into their bodies. Um, so the key psychographics of our customers are really that we do a great job of hitting the can of curious market. Uh, they look at our packaging, they look at our form factors, and they think these are things that I know how to use and I'm comfortable using. Um, nothing is more rewarding to us when we see how people have really had the quality of their lives improved by using our products. But we also resonate with this kind of experienced user because they look at our ingredients as a super accurate way to dose the creations that they're already making. And it's like a fun, entertaining uh, gift um, kind of like a party trick to pull out. And we're really fundamentally rooted in things like recipes. Um, and this is some of our community. Uh, we do really great with user generated content because we're not just a package that you unwrap and consume. The end result of how everybody's consuming our products is different. And so all of our organic growth has really been fueled by that. We have four different ways we make money. Um, selling to dispensaries, we're in about 50 so far. Um, hemp CBD retailers um, as well, all throughout the country. We sell direct to consumer on potlyshop.com. And then because we own our own licenses, we actually use them and our facilities as platforms for other emerging brands. Um, and that really gives us platform potential going forward. Uh, Men Men, Erewhon, Equinox are some of the uh, brands that we partner with that you may have heard of. We're currently doing about twenty to $30,000 in revenue per month, but we're scaling that quickly and we're confident about our growth. We're trying to hit about $100,000 a month by early next year. And we're raising a million dollars on our safe note. We have, um, as Julie mentioned, two thirds of that already committed or, or um, cashed in, so to speak. And we're looking for other partners who really understand the space, really un understand this vision of us trying to create the new category of healthy edibles. So with that, I'd love to answer any questions. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Nick first. To see if you have any questions. Absolutely, Christine. Thanks for the presentation. Um, you know, California is a, a state. I think we've probably done 150 licenses down there for clients and partners and investments. So I really like the space, even though tax rates a little too high. Some things are like a little problematic, and uh, many municipalities haven't opted in. Uh, congrats on the initial successes. It's always hard, like those first revenue, getting the licenses, compliant facilities, Bureau of Cannabis Control for your distribution license. And then you also have uh, the BCC for your distribution. Doing your own distribution is critical. Like if you don't have distribution, best products in the world, what's the point? Um, you know, so as you're scaling this, you know, $20,000, $30,000 a month, like I remember my first part-time job, just kidding. Um, it's a good start. In California now, if you're in 50 dispensaries, you've probably gotten taken advantage of on some shelf scale contracts. Um, you've got your wholesale distribution on your CBD side, very smart on the wise, like two structure model, so you can get interstate commerce done on that other side. Kind of like my presentation earlier, remember the compliant labels, but how then, how are you going to do more? Like, how are you going to take over California and take over the world? Because a good brand that's using like locally sourced ingredients, like I, I can maybe use your California based honey for some Massachusetts adult use infused things. If you like your secret sauce, how to infuse the honey and so forth. But what are your expansion plans when it comes to either brand licensing, new market acquisitions, or sometimes paying that 15% potentially with some of the big distribution players in Cali to get into like 200 stores here by like, let's say the end of the year? 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Distribution is a hard game, um, as you pointed out. We are self-distributing in that we're doing the sales ourselves on the cannabis side, but we do have a logistics distribution partner um, that we work with here in California on the cannabis side. Um, we're really just getting started. If you look at the dispensaries that we're in, um, the average lifetime of the account relationship and how long it's matured is really just five months. And so for a lot of our dispensaries, uh, Apothecarium being a big San Francisco-based chain that we got into late February, right before COVID hit. So really our main growth vehicle for this year on the Canvas side is increasing those account values. And that's something that we haven't been able to do. Um, so we definitely want to increase account values. We think that our brand really is probably a good fit for 150 dispensaries in California realistically not that many more past that. I know like ideally we'd be in 500, but it's just not the case for us, but that's fine. Um, we know it. We have started thinking a little bit about state by state expansion from a licensing perspective. And so we have spoken um, to a few operating partners within the Illinois market um, and we are starting to explore that, but really trying to take it slow until we've expanded into California as much as we possibly can. On a quick kind of clarification too. So you're, you're doing yeah. a million around through that platform. You've done about 600 plus K. So you got like 300 plus K on the table still. Yeah. What was the valuation you were setting like that? First it's a $5 million pre-money cap. Yeah. On a safe note. Um, and then on the hemp CBD side, I actually think that that distribution channel is really interesting in that, you know, even though we're a food product and we sell in grocers like Erewhon, we're not like a UNFI K he fit necessarily just yet. Uh, we do think that there's going to be a large player that's going to come around, but we have no concern scaling when it comes from a sourcing perspective. Um, yes, our story is rooted in our, having our own bees and having our own hives, but we have um, access to a network of really great ingredients within California. And my co-founder's family is really well versed in scaling businesses at a national level and a global level as well. So they, they ship internationally and we really leaned on their operating chops for that. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we are out of time, so we can't get another judge in for a question for you, but thank you, Christine. Okay. Thank Appreciate you so that. much. Okay. So uh, our last presenter and the last name that I will butcher for today uh, is Duma Wenshu. He's a co-founder of Province Brands in Canada. Um, so this is a beverage technology company that has developed the first of its kind patent pending process for brewing fermented beverages from non-starch plant materials. Province brands um, earned global notoriety um, by raising more than 23 million already um, from venture investors and now employs some of the top research researchers in the industry. Prior to founding Providence Brands of Canada, Mr. Wenshu co-founded and ran a Colorado-based cannabinoid research firm which sold the canopy growth for more, more than 400 million Canadian dollars. Congratulations on that. Um, so there are 13 employees of Providence Brands. We've talked about the funding round already. I'm just going to turn it over to you, Duma. Welcome. Thank you, and uh, I am uh, sharing my screen now. I hope you can hear it. Uh, this will be a lot of fun today because we are talking about beer. And uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that people have been brewing beer since long before recorded history. Uh, these days, the brewing industry is a 900 billion Canadian dollar industry. In fact, one third of all the alcohol sold on the planet is beer. And despite constant improvements in how we brew beer, almost all the world's beer is still brewed from barley. Not hops, by the way. A lot of people think it's hops. That's just for flavor. And technically, you could use other grains. Most people don't. So it remains that for millennia, it has been chemically impossible to brew a beer without starting from some kind of a grain or a starch. And this limitation has caused so many problems for the brewing industry over the years. In fact, there's a whole new problem with this coronavirus that is disrupting global supply chains and brewers are worried about where are they going to get their grains. Now, this is just one of the many problems that our patent pending brewing technology solves. Uh, we are, as she mentioned, a beverage technology company and we are dedicated to creating a better class of beer. And thanks to the hard work of our uh, incredible research and development team, we have effectively created an entirely new brewing tradition. 
uh, one which uses, which allows brewers to grow directly from the plant to the pint. And to yeah. brew beer, for example, from any kind of wood or shrub or grass or, or uh, whatever is locally available, or even to brew from plant waste. A great example of that is uh, we were recently approached by a global spirits company and they asked if we can take the leftover parts of the agave plant when they make their tequila and turn that into a beer. Uh, and uh, uh, it's not just a marketing gimmick. This is actually a way for this company to uh, reduce their carbon emissions and to reduce their waste disposal costs. And why stop with agave? Think about how much plant material all around the world ends up uh, carted off to landfill year after year. Think of the methane that's produced when it ends up in that landfill and breaks down. Think about the carbon dioxide of shipping it uh, to, to landfill. Uh, with our technology, we can avoid all of that. We can also brew from food waste. We can brew from the spent grains, which are left over from traditional brewing and distilling. And uh, we can brew from hemp or marijuana waste uh, from industrial production. And when we do that, we can make products that are alcohol free and intoxicate using marijuana or its phytocannabinoids. No matter what we brew from, our products have less waste. Uh, they're lower cost. Uh, we believe at large scale, they're about a 20% savings over traditional brewing. Uh, and they're less harmful, not just to the environment, but for your health, lower calorie, gluten-free. And they'll contain xyloligamers, which are prebiotics. If we make the beverage from hemp or marijuana, it would contain phytocannabinoids like CBD. So how do we do this, right? To understand that, you have to understand how beer has been brewed for many, many years. First, you start by milling your barley. Uh, you then mash it and lauder it. And all of this is designed to create a sugar, which goes into your boil kettle. And from there, you can begin your fermentation. What we have done at Province Brands is effectively create an entirely new front end for the brewing process. Uh, so you start by chopping up the plant material. And in this video, uh, you can see our team actually chopping up some hemp material that we're working with. Uh, and uh, then you go into a cooking step in the process. Uh, here you can see our team uh, using our proprietary cooking process uh, to cook the, the plant material. Um, and, uh, and, and then the next step is a liquefaction, uh, where using these liquefaction reactors, we actually convert the solid plant material, as you can see in the still image, over a period of about four days into a liquid. And that liquid, as it happens, is actually a liquid sugar, which can then go into your boil kettle, and you can brew using all the same technology and equipment that you would have in the old-fashioned way. How do we generate revenue? Well, for one, we're launching branded products using this unique technology. Uh, first of those is Cambridge Bay. It's the world's first beer brewed from hemp, just four ingredients, no grain, no starch, no sugar, 7% alcohol, tastes just amazing. And in the Canadian cannabis industry, uh, we are preparing to launch Daga Imperial, the world's first beer brewed from marijuana, actually brewed from the waste stream created by the cannabis industry here in Canada. And we recognize that we've got some pretty stiff competition here in the Canadian cannabis beverage industry, but we have an advantage over all of these big brands because when they make marijuana beverages, they have to infuse those beverages with a marijuana oil in order to convey a psychoactive effect. With our technology, we can actually brew from the plant itself, which means that when the customer walks into the dispensary, there's just so much more the bud tender can tell them about our products and our unique brewing process. They can talk about how we're part of the circular economy, how we give a second life to plant material that would otherwise end up in landfill. They can talk about how we're lower carb, gluten-free, no sugar, uh, you know, just four ingredients, cannabis, hops, water, and yeast. They can talk about uh, all, all the, the benefits of our process. And this is what we in the beverage industry call a reason to speak. And this is especially important in the Canadian cannabis industry where uh, where paid advertising is not allowed, right? So that word of mouth really matters. Another way we can generate revenue, co-packing in our 123,000 square foot brewery, which is still under construction, but when we wrap up the construction, we have several LOIs uh, to co-pack for other clients. 
And, uh, and lastly, licensing this technology, not just to companies in the cannabis industry, but there's opportunity to license to companies in the alcohol industry and the functional beverage industry as well. Uh, as was mentioned, we've raised uh, over the past three years uh, more than $23 million. We are in the middle of a funding round. I'm happy to talk about that as well, uh, but I will stop here and answer questions. Uh, Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Duma. That anyone may have. Thank you very Thank much. You. I learned a lot about um, how to make beer. You just basically boiled it down to a minute, which was very impressive. <laughs> um, so David Koenig, we haven't heard from you in a while. Do you have any questions for Duma? Uh, you know what, it, it was really good. The one thing, and maybe I, I missed it, is uh, the five-year uh, projection, the five-year forecast for the company. Um, if we're looking mainly uh, just domestic, uh, international, we're looking to do domestic and international. So I don't know if you went through that part and I missed it. If so, I apologize. I didn't miss it. You know, when, it, when they give you five minutes to pitch, you, you got to leave a few things out. But, uh, but yeah. I do have it on the screen right now, if you can see. Um, so, so basically, uh, you know, this is an expensive process. There's a lot of CapEx. Uh, we, we do sort of, uh, it does take us about three years to become profitable. And we have very, very realistic sales targets, as you can see over those first three years. I mean, hopefully we'll sell much, much more than that. Um, and then when you talk about domestic international, we're really focused on the Canadian market. But in year, uh, year four and year five, we do intend to uh, branch out into uh, the United States for the alcohol product, not the marijuana product, only the alcohol product in the United States, um, and, uh, and into Luxembourg, where it's a tiny market, but they do allow marijuana product there. So we'd like to launch uh, the marijuana beverage product in, in Luxembourg. Uh, and then just to show a little bit more on that topic in terms of the margin, which I'm sure is really important. Um, uh, that's down here, sorry. Uh, you, know, you can see our operating pro profit margin by different product category. And, and here our licensing is you know, just beginning in year five. We wanted to be very conservative and not, and not count on big global uh, breweries licensing from us in day one, but, but it is very profitable, high margin activity. Um, marijuana product uh, is a very high margin activity. Alcohol is a reasonable margin as well. Great, thank you for sharing. For... I appreciate mm -hmm. that, thank you. Yeah, one quick question. Anybody have a quick one? Maybe Matthew or Jay? No? Well, I'll make a statement because okay. Duma has been in the industry for a long time and he certainly knows what he's talking about. Uh, his pitch just continues to be more refined. Uh, Duma, thanks for hanging in there and continuing to build this segment. You've got something special going, man, and I'm a big fan of yours. I know we all are. We've all seen your journey. Um, and um, I know all of us would like to be a part of it. Some of us will, some of us won't. Um, I hope we can. But uh, keep doing what you're doing, man. It's, it's really fun to watch. Thank you, Matthew. I'm a big fan of yours as well. Excellent. Great stuff. So uh, thank you very much, Duma. Judges, if you can go ahead and get everything submitted um, so that we can figure out who are the top three companies. And uh, Brad, I will ask you, I'm not sure what you want to do about um, the audience votes. Um, I don't have any instructions on that. I thought there was a place for them to go, but we now have about uh, 10 minutes for the voting. Um, I want to thank all the judges for your, for your questions. Um, I want to thank all the presenters. It is not easy to present your business in five minutes. It's, I thought it was impossible the first time I was asked to do it. Um, so good job to everybody. Uh, keep at it no matter what happens today. Um, you know, I've been trying to get Pan Exchange off the ground for nine years now. So stick with it, everybody. Um, ah, here's the, so you should see on your screen um, a pop-up question. This, this is for audience choice. It strictly tells me not to vote. Yes. <laughs> yeah, judges should use the form that was sent to you. Uh, for the audience, we're doing a separate audience choice. Okay. Thank you for that. So, Brad, do you want to just let me know when you want me to jump back in, or is someone else covering the um, the winners? Okay. 
Hey, Julie, I believe you're going to continue to cover the winners and announce them once all of the polling comes in from both the audience and the judges. Okay, great. Great job. So does, that, does that get extra credit for also hosting? <laughs> no, you should actually dock me a few points because that would be cheating. Okay. <laughs> Should remind you all there's also a networking room um, with the Tracy. Do you have the link to that or can someone? We're going to be posting that up in the chat box here in just a few minutes. Once we wrap up the announcements, you can also go onto the website and find it there as well. But I'll make sure everyone has super clear instructions. Um, I'm going to do a full recap of everything and let everyone know how to join us in the room. I'm, I'm really excited about some of the conversations that are going to spring up today. There's been so much that we've covered that I, I don't even know where to start my conversations. <laughs> I what was your favorite part of the day so far? Mine? Um, I mean, I, I, well, I, I was really glad when I was done introducing all of the judges because I wasn't sure how I was going to squeeze all that in. <laughs> so, um, I, I love this part of it. Um, you know, having been there and, and, and had do, doing the pitch competition, it's, it's so tough. Um, but I really enjoy the, the energy everyone brings to it and the different perspectives and, and seriously deep expertise come into the table of all of, all of these panelists or, or presenters, I mean. That, yeah. That's what I enjoyed the most. How about you? Absolutely. I was really, really impressed with the lineup today. There was, there was a lot of variance in the different topics that we covered. I learned so much more about hempcrete and beer <laughs> mm -hmm. and just in general. I, I just thought it was a really, really thorough, uh, well-rounded day overall, and I've, I've really enjoyed it. I've really enjoyed talking about the issues with COVID as well, because, you know, as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, as an advocate, these times have just really changed for all of us so drastically. And to watch how everyone's learning how to pivot has been really interesting in this new digital world. It, it, it is changing. I think the most interesting thing for all of us is we were shut down so fast but yet we don't know, there's no, end, there's no end yet. We don't know what it looks like. And we all, this is the most nimble we've ever been asked to be in our careers. And, and launching a company in this, in this era, it takes a, an extra special entrepreneur to keep it going, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I've been running my own companies for about 14 years now. And I have always been one of these people that love to have employees in the office. I just felt like you always got so much more done. And, you know, being at home would cause distractions and delays. And I, I still would rather be in the office, but I'm really enjoying being at home. And I'm really watching, I'm, I'm really thoroughly impressed with the world as a whole and how fast we've picked up this digital um, footprint that we're all using for, you know, for Zoom conferences, for communications, for file sharing, you know, the apps that are popping up, getting my groceries delivered to my house every day, anytime I want, which right. is amazing. I love that. Because with an immunocompromised child, well, Sophie is an immunocompromised now. She's been off chemo for six months, but we're a family that has had bad things happen to them. And so we by no means take risks. So we literally have left the house. I don't know, maybe four or five times in the last few months. And yeah. it's, really, it's, it's really refreshing seeing how all these companies are picking it up and helping us all stay safe in this very uncertain time. Mm -hmm. I agree. I do. I, I, I mean, it, there's so many challenges that everyone has here. I'd love to ask some of the judges. Um, we've clearly accelerated the pace of webinars and Zoom meetings and podcasts and um, do any of you have any opinion? Do you think we're going to get Zoom fatigue and just everyone go offline for August? Or do you think we're going to keep going like this? Because so far, I mean, I, like this is a new network for me where we're converging between hemp and Canada, cannabis. So today was fantastic. Um, and it's still new and fresh for me, but I'm wondering if it's going to fizzle out soon. I mean, you've got a nation industry that's desperate for capital a product that's already makes its own demand and will continue to do so. So now is actually the time, like blood's in the water. This is when we eat. This is when we make the big, big moves. When most people are sitting on their ass watching Netflix 12 to 20 hours a day, potentially. So you know, the biggest thing I'm seeing is like, we have to get comfortable with and being able to like have digital conversations with limited partners, like with our investors versus like face-to-face -face meetings in London. And the same thing, like being comfortable, I mean, already overseeing now about 40 million in deployment during this kind of COVID time, which there's so much more time, but the main thing for like anyone looking for cap, this is 
no different than before. Like who you are, what you do, why you do it, how you're different, how much do you need? How are you gonna spend my money? How much do I get back and when? Like be clear and you're an expert in what you know, but dumb it down to someone who doesn't know, but have it make sense, like very clearly, like with some of these pitches today. And, and Nick brings up a good point because one thing that, that we see a lot is we always talk about if it takes more than three text messages or more than three emails, pick up the phone and call. And we tell that to all our clients. And the one thing, especially if a lot of our uh, high net worth individuals, the reason what they like most about us at UCS Advisors is we talk on the phone all the time. Mm -hmm. The video is an added bonus. And so we asked a question about Zoom fatigue. We joke around and say, okay, do we really got to do a face-to-face -face or can we just do a regular phone call? But people that can communicate, believe in the art of communication and not afraid to get up and actually talk on the phone, they're doing well. I mean, and especially, I don't know about the other people here, but uh, we're getting a lot of phone calls for people who would normally never invest in the private sector for hemp or cannabis. I mean, just us alone, we've picked up over 25 new uh, private investors in the last eight weeks. And wow. they're all looking for deals in the private sector. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you can get on the phone and communicate, and as Nick said, Nick put it best, like almost treat people like a third grader, you know, don't assume right. they know stuff and rather have them say to you, hey, you know what, I know what you're talking about. Let's get to the next level. So, but, uh, you know, people, if you can have a regular conversation, you don't mind talking, you know, you can still get the investors to come in and invest in your company. One of the things that I've really noticed as well, I've, I've got a group that I'm a member of that has some of the top CMOs, the biggest brands in the world. And, and we do these, these meetups usually about once a week. And it's been really interesting watching the conversations evolve about how people are, um, you know, trying to set their business, businesses apart. And one of the things that keeps coming up over and over and over again is authenticity and story. Because we are in a time right now where people need hope. They need something that's uplifting. They need a company that is rooted in some sort of, of, of interest in, in helping make the world a better place. And these, these oils and these concretes and these fibers and, and these cannabinoids, they all have the ability to have some sort of really incredible story rooted behind them because of all the magical things that they do. I just want to add, Julie, this is a, this is a time, and, and Tracy, thank you guys for, for, for doing this. And, and everybody on the panel, this is a, you know, not, not all uh, of, of the operators had the luxury to travel and, and attend all the different uh, networking events that were going around, you know, globally. And really this is a, you know, a time to, to take advantage of, uh, I don't even call it downtime. It's just a different time really. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I know that, you know, some of us on this panel, Matt in particular, if anyone's going to be getting fatigue, it might be Matt, the guy's on a, a Zoom, maybe multiple times a day. But the reality is, it's because he loves to do it. We love to do it. Um, and Nick said it great earlier, we're not spending the time, you know, commuting or, or whatever we're doing. Um, while we commute, might as well, you know, get together on Zoom and, and uh, help forward uh, the industry as best we can. I wanted to say this is, you know, the closest we're going to get to having, you know, personal face-to-face -face chemistry. Uh, and, uh, but I agree with David, you know, this has been somewhat equalizing in terms of uh, being able to reach people uh, because you can't attend an event. And actually it's more intimate in the sense that you might attend an event hoping to be able to network with the right person you were looking for. And um, we kind of make ourselves semi-captive on these Zoom calls. I'm in the professional services business and um, also am involved in providing testimony in court and deal with a lot of lawyers who are having, they're kind of going through a transition. They're used to being a lot, a lot more person to person contact, uh, being in front of a judge, being in front of a mediator or an arbitrator. And so it's a big learning curve uh, for uh, lawyers and, and financial advisors. Um, you know, we are at the end of the day, you know, animals, right? So, so we want to get the feeling of the person we're with. So I will say this, if you are an entrepreneur and a capital raiser, and you can raise money in a business that's actually in deep distress, then you are really going to be successful. Excellent. Thank you all. I want to thank all you. Uh, Tr Tracy, thank you for for keeping this 
going and, and going, running smoothly. I want to thank Brad Turner. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, this is the, one of the first events where there is a deep convergence between hemp and cannabis, and I'm really excited about that. Thank you all to the judges. Um, you've been fantastic. I have results. <laughs> Ready? Okay. From the judges, and the, and the answers are different. The winner, the judges winner, they have chosen Bastcore. Congratulations um, for, for Bastcore from the judges winner and the audience is Levadura. And those are our two winners today. Great job to everyone that was involved.